Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. In Judges chapter 4 and 5, we learn about Deborah. There were a few judges before Deborah, but in this episode we are focusing on the history of Ephraim and Manasseh. Each time Israel fell under oppression from a neighboring nation, they would cry to God, and each time God would raise up a judge to conquer the enemy and lead Israel back to God's favor. But after each judge dies, Israel would forget God again and fall into following false gods, or as we have learned in episode 2, demonic entities. In the book of Judges chapter 4, we read about Deborah. This was the time when Israel fell under the oppression of Jabin, king of Canaan, who ruled from Hazar, a Canaanite stronghold. And you'll see Hazar is up in the region of Naphtali in the north. He had 900 chariots of iron and dominated and oppressed the Israelites for 20 years until the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh for help. A prophetess named Deborah judged Israel, and she lived near Bethel in Mount Ephraim. She called a man named Barak, a man of the tribe of Naphtali, and said to him, God has said for you to take 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and Zebulun and go near Mount Tabar, and I will bring the captain of Jabin's army near you with his chariots, and I will deliver them into your hand. You will find Bethel on the map here. It's just below Shiloh in Ephraim. So she sent him to take people of Naphtali and Zebulun and go against this guy with the, the leader of Canaan. And you'll see Mount Tabor is right there on the border between Zebulun and Ishakar. So she tells him to go there where God will bring this army and give it into their hands. And Barak answered Deborah and said, Go with me, and I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. Deborah answered him, I will go with you, but the journey you take will not be for your honor, because God will deliver the captain of Jabin's army into the hand of a woman. So, and this would have been an embarrassment to any king. So Deborah and Barak went and gathered the army and stood against the captain of Jabin's army and defeated them with a great slaughter. And the captain of Jabin's army fled and hid inside the tent of a woman. And uh, this, this place where he went with the tent to the tent was an ally of his. And when Barak finally found him, the woman had killed him in his sleep by driving a nail into his temple. And then there is a great uh, song of victory in Judges chapter 5. The song of the mighty victory of Deborah and Barak. So there's in two ways that he sh had to share his glory with a woman. In the song, he shares the victory with Deborah. And in the actual events, he shares the victory with the woman who drove the nail into the guy's temple. And this is the beginning of a series of victories that overthrew the power of Jabin, and the land had peace for 40 years. Now, after the 40 years, they forgot again about God, and the next judge we're going to take a quick look at here is Gideon. He's in uh, Judges chapter 6 to 8. The, the Israelites started to do evil, so God allowed the Midianites to gain power over them. Midianites are the sons of Abraham through Keturah. She had six sons with Abraham. Um, we read about this in the uh, episode we did on Abraham where after Abraham had uh, Ishmael and then Isaac, he then, uh, after the death of his wife, Sarah, 
he took another wife and went and moved east and that wife's name was Keturah and she had six sons with him and one of them sons was Midian and the, he was the father of the Midianites and the Midianites were uh, they started out as uh, Abrahamic uh, they, they were sons of Abraham but they um, during the 400 years when Israel was in Egypt as slaves the Midianites had turned to other deities. They came with their cattle and their tents and their camels by the thousands, and the land was ruined in their wake, which impoverished the Israelites. The Israelites had moved into caves and built strongholds because of the Midianites, but they could not farm or graze, and the land was being ruined. So they cried out to God for help. God sent a prophet to tell them, I delivered you out of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors, and I gave you their land. I told you not to fear the gods of the Amorites, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now Gideon was a man of the tribe of Manasseh, and he was at a place near Bethel, threshing his wheat, and hiding it from the Midianites. An angel appeared to him and said, The Lord is with thee, O mighty man of valor. Gideon said, If God is with us, why is all this happening to us? God has forsaken us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. The angel answered him and said, The Lord has said, Go and save Israel from the Midianites. I have sent thee. So Gideon says, well, how will I save Israel? My family is poor, and I am the least in my family. God answered him through the angel and said, I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And then Gideon said, well, don't leave until I bring a gift. And he came back with a basket of meat and unleavened bread for him. And the angel told him to lay it on a rock. And the angel touched the rock with his staff, and a fire came out of the rock and consumed it. Then the angel left. And Gideon then built a, an altar there and named it the Peace of Yahweh. God then appeared and told him to take a young bull and throw down his father's altar to Baal and cut down his grove and built an altar to Yahweh there and used the wood of the grove to offer up the bull. So Gideon's father had this grove with the bull and an altar to Baal. So Gideon took ten of his servants to help him and he did it at night because he feared his father and the men of the city. In the morning the men of the city saw the altar of Baal broken down and the grove cut down and all that was done, and they started asking who did it, and they found out it was Gideon. They went to Gideon's father and said, Bring out your son that he may die for this. Gideon's father said, Let Baal fight for himself. If he is a god, let Baal take revenge this morning for his altar and his grove. And he renamed Gideon Jerubel which means Baal will contend. So he gives Gideon a new name. And then all the Midianites and their allies were gathered at the valley of Jezreel. Now that's, uh, if you remember, that's up near Jezreel and Ishrakar there. And, and it stretches out towards Megiddo. So the Midianites were all gathered there. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet and gathered his own tribal family, the family of Abiezer, one of the families of Manasseh. And he sent messengers into all of Manasseh, and they came out and sent messengers into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they also came out to meet him. Gideon then asked God for a sign. He said, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and it, if it is dry on the, all the ground, but the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, 
then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. And in the morning the fleece was wet, while the, all the ground was dry. Gideon then asked one more time for proof. He asked that the fleece be dry and the ground be wet the next morning. And then it was that night it was so. Gideon, who was also named Jerubbaal, moved his army to camp near the Midianite camp, 32,000 strong. God then said to Gideon, The army is too big for me to help you. They will say they have done it themselves if I help them. Go tell the people, whoever is afraid may go home now. He did that, and 22,000 of them left, leaving 10,000. God then said, They are still too many. Bring them up the hill to the river while I will test them. He then told them all, Drink from the river. And he sorted out those who drew water from the river with their hands from those who got on their knees and drank straight out of the river. The ones who got on their knees were sent home, leaving Gideon with only 300 men. Gideon was in the mountain with his men, he kept the 300 with him, but sent all the others back to their tents. The Midianites were down in the valley. God said, Now go with your 300 down to the Midianites, and I will give them into your hand. But if you are too afraid, go down with your servant, Fura, and listen to what they are saying, and that will strengthen you. So Gideon goes down with his servant, Fura, and they hide in the foliage and listen to the Midianites. And they get near the camp, and the Midianites and all of their allies are there without number, as the sand of the seaside. And Gideon heard a man tell a dream to his fellow. He said, A cake of barley bread rolled into the camp and flattened a tent. His friend interpreted it and said, This is Gideon the Israelite. God has delivered all of this host into his hand. Gideon was strengthened by hearing that and returned to his camp. He divided the 300 into three groups and he gave each of them a trumpet and a clay pot and a lamp. And they surrounded the camp and when Gideon gave the signal, they all broke their clay pots and blew their trumpets and waved their lamps and they yelled, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And when the Midianites and their allies heard it, they went into a panic and started fighting each other. And then they fled into the Jordan Valley and headed south along the Jordan River. The men of Israel gathered out of Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh. So all the men that were sent home saw what was happening and they all regathered. And they pursued the Midianite army. Gideon sent messengers all through Ephraim, saying, Come, help us head them off at Beth Bara. And the Ephraimites came down from the mountains and headed them off. Beth Bara is uh, just down, it's on the Jordan River, just down near Gilgal. It's along the Jordan River there. So. The Ephraimites came down from the mountain and headed them off there. The Ephraimites defeated the Midianites at Beth Bera, where they beheaded two Midianite princes and went to meet Gideon on the west side of the Jordan. So the Midianites were escaping back into their land where they came from, to their homeland. Remember, the land of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben that was land that was conquered from the Midianites in earlier times. But the Midianites had actually, during that, those battles, they had moved east from there and settled east of that. So they were uh, escaping back to their homeland. There's a river that is uh, on the map between the land of Gad and the land of Manasseh to the north, that border is actually a river. It's a valley that goes up into the mountain. And the Midianites, when they were uh, defeated by and headed off by the Ephraimites, they headed up that river. 
and Gideon was pursuing them up that valley, and the Ephraimites also were pursuing them, and they met up with Gideon up in that area. And when they met Gideon, they were angry at him. They said, Why didn't you call us when you went to fight the Midianites? They were very angry that they were not called in the first place. And Gideon said, What, I, what have I done in comparison to you? You have slain two princes of the Midianites and stopped them. Isn't the gleaning of Ephraim greater than the vintage of Abiezer? What does that mean? Uh, gleaning is when the gatherers are gathering grapes, they leave a few behind. Uh, ones that aren't quite ripe enough or they miss some. The gleaning is when after they finish gathering, you, they go back over it. And that's the gleaning, getting the ones that were missed or the ones that are now ready. Um, but it was a custom in Israel that uh, when you gather the grapes, you leave, you don't glean the grapes. You leave that, that was left for poor people. So after the gatherers are done, the poor were allowed to go in and glean what was left. And people, as a form of charity, the gatherers sometimes would leave behind stuff for them. So the vintage is the wine, the wine that was made from the best grapes, the, the wine that was kept. So... He's saying, isn't the gleaning of Ephraim, I'm just picking up what you left. And isn't that better than the vintage of my family, Abiezer? So he puts them up on a pedestal, basically. And Gideon and his 300 men then crossed over the Jordan, and they were tired and hungry from the pursuit. They came to a town named Succoth. Succoth is the place where Jacob settled and built booths for his cattle after wrestling with God in the night and meeting with his brother Izu, as we discussed in episode 14. Remember when Jacob wrestled in the night with the angel and the angel renamed him Israel, or he wrestled with God, they say? Um, and then after he met Izu, he built booths and he called the place Succoth. And then Gideon asked the men of Succoth for bread for his men, because he said, I am pursuing after two kings of Midian. But the men of Succoth said, We will not give bread to your army, because you have not defeated them yet. That's like, uh, what if you don't beat them? They're going to get mad at us for giving you bread, so you have to beat them first, and then we'll give you bread. And Gideon answered them and said, after I have defeated these two kings, I will come back and tear your flesh with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. Gideon and the 300 men then came to Penuel, the face of God. That is the place where Jacob wrestled with the angel all night, as we discussed just earlier. The men of Penuel answered the same as Succoth. And Gideon said, when I come again in peace, I will break down your tower. The two Midianite kings were held up in Karkor, in a stronghold of the Midianites. They still had 15,000 men out of the 135,000 they had at the beginning. Gideon and his 300 went pursuing them by going further east and then coming back on them because they stopped to rest, but Gideon and his men kept going all night. And they went past them, and I guess to fool them, thinking that they had missed them. But during the night, they went all the way around and came back and flanked them, even though they had no bread from those two towns. And when he met them, he captured the two kings, and this dispersed the army of the Midianites. He then also captured the man, he captured a man from Succoth, what was he doing there? And he found out all about the leaders of Succoth, 77 men. He went to Succoth and he brought out the two 
Midianite kings and said, Look now, they are my prisoners, the ones you were afraid of and wouldn't help me. And he took the seventy-seven leaders and elders and had them whipped with thorns. He then went to Penuel and broke down their tower. He also killed all the men of that town. Gideon then said to the two kings of Midian, What did the men look like who you slew at Tabor? Mount Tabor is a large dome-shaped mountain in the valley of Jezreel, where the battle began. They answered, Yes, they were like the children of a king, just like you. Gideon said, They were my mother's people. As the Lord lives, if you would have saved them alive, I would have let you live. Gideon then slew them and took the ornaments off their camels' necks. The men of Israel then said to Gideon, Rule over us now, you and your sons, because you have delivered us from the Midianites. But Gideon said, No, God will rule over you. Gideon then asked them for all the gold earrings they had taken from the enemy they had slain. They were Ishmaelites. They had gold earrings, and the Israelites had been collecting the earrings from the dead. Ishmaelites are closely linked to the Midianites. Both are the sons of Abraham. Now the earrings was more likely nose rings. And the ornaments around the camel's neck come from the Hebrew word Saharan, which is a moon symbol. Likely a commonly used crescent moon. The king's camels had large gold crescent moons on their necks and the army had smaller crescent nose rings. The crescent is an ancient symbol associated with the moon gods or goddesses. Arabia worshipped a form of the ancient moon god of Ur named Nana. As we discussed this in episode 4, one of the most ancient religions known to history. She was also named Sin in Arabia. The Midianites, Ishmaelites, Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites were all closely related because during the time of Abraham they were all relations. The Ishmaelites and Midianites were sons of Abraham. The Moabites and Ammonites were the sons of Abraham's nephew Lot after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when he had sexual relations with his two daughters that gave birth to the Moabites and the Ammonites. And the Edomites were the sons of Izu, Jacob's brother. They all worshipped Yahweh at first. Even Moses took a wife from the daughter of a Midianite priest and learned of Yahweh while, learning, while living with the Midianites. But all of these tribes eventually began to worship the deities of Mesopotamia or adapted forms of them. Gideon took all of the gold from the camels and the nose rings of the Midianites and he melted it down and he made an ephod. An ephod is like a golden girdle that the high priest would wear. Now, um, during the time when Moses was in leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, the, the Levitical priesthood was set up by God with the sanctuary and the tent in Shiloh. And in that system, the high priest, who only goes into the inner sanctuary once a year at a special day, this high priest wore a golden girdle called the ephod, and it had the two um, um, stones on it called Ummon and Thummon. And they would ask God questions, and God would light up one for yes or the other for no. And so Gideon had an ephod made of all this gold. And he placed it in his city, in Ophir which is a city in Ephraim. All of Israel went to Ophir to revere the ephod of Gideon. The country had relative peace for 40 years until Gideon died. 
Gideon had several wives and concubines with, with whom he had begotten 70 children because he was a famous ruler in Israel after that. And he, after he died, the people of Israel started worshiping a god named Baal Berith, which means Baal of the Covenant. You see, Gideon, he had made this golden ephod, which was kind of mixing the religion of Baal with the religion of Yahweh. And this gave birth to this religion that they had at that time called Baal Berith. And, it's, and uh, remember Gideon had two names from his father. Gideon, which means warrior, and Jerob Baal, which means Baal will contend. This seems to have confused the Israelites who were worshipping at Ophir, where Gideon had knocked down his father's shrine to Baal, and he had now set up this golden ephod in its place. Now the next judge we'll talk about is Ambilek. Okay, um, this is in Judges chapter 9. Zerubbabel, who was Gideon, had a son named Ambilek with a concubine, a servant woman from Shechem. Now you'll see Shechem is right, right there in the, just north of Ephraim in the, in the territory of uh, Manasseh. After Zerubbabel died, Ambilek went to his kinsmen in Shechem and said, Which is better, for one to rule over you or for seventy to rule over you? All the men of Shechem began to follow Ambilek. They gave him seventy pieces of silver from the shrine of Baal Berith. He used that to hire vain and light persons to follow him. And then they went to Ophrah and slew all the brothers and sons of Jerobal on one stone. The youngest son, Jotham, hid himself and lived. So they killed all the seventy sons of Gideon. And all the men of Shechem gathered by a pillar there. And there was also a Milo. A Milo is a, a defensive wall or a rampart uh, made of stone. And the house of Milo was joined. So this was, um, it was a, probably a battleground there. And this was a defensive buttress of some kind that they would use to fight on. Um, they would use it as a stronghold, probably. They would get up on top of it, and then they would fight the army that tried to get up. Okay, they were all gathered that there to make Ambilek king. The one Jotham, he was the young child that hid from them when they killed all of his 70 brothers. When he heard it, he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim and called out to them. Now, Mount Gerizim is called the Mount of Blessing. If you look at Shechem, you'll see on one side of it is Mount Gerizim, and on the other side of it is Mount Ebel. And Mount Ebel is the Mount of Cursing, and Shechem's in the middle. And there's very good acoustics there from mountain to mountain. When Moses led the people into the Promised Land, he commanded Joshua that after you lead these people into the land of Canaan, you will go to this place, Shechem. And remember, Shechem was uh, a place where Jacob lived. Um, that was the town where Jacob's daughter was uh, raped by the king's, king of Shechem's son. And Jacob's two sons, Simon and Levi, uh, made a deal with the whole town that they, if they got circumcised, then they could marry their sister. 
that their, the son of the king could marry their sister. But after they all got circumcised and were unable to fight the next day, then um, Simon and Levi went and slaughtered all of them. So Shechem had these two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebel. And Moses had commanded Joshua, okay, you get the people and all of these tribes on Mount Gerizim and all of these other tribes on Mount Ebel, all these tribes on Mount Gerizim will pronounce the blessings if you follow the commands of Jehovah. And all the tribes that are on Mount Ebel, they will then pronounce the cursings if you forget the, the commands of Jehovah. And they did this. And the acoustics are so good there, people tested it nowadays, that you can actually hear a person talking if you talk, stand on the one mountain and just talk, the people on the other mountain can hear it. While they were gathered in Shechem, these people of Ambilek, um, Jotham was standing on top of Mount Gerizim, and he called out to them, and he said a parable. He says, Listen to me, men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees went forth to anoint a king over them. They went to the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree said, Should I leave my fatness, which is olive oil, with which they honor both God and man? and be promoted over the trees. Then they went to the fig tree, reign over us. The fig tree said, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit to be promoted over the trees? Then they went to the vine, reign over us. The vine said, Should I leave my wine, which cheers God and men, to be promoted over the trees? Then they went to the bramble, reign over us. The bramble said, if you anoint me king over you, then come put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now Jotham's interp then Jotham interpreted this parable to them. He said, My father fought for you and changed his life to deliver out of the hand of the Midianites. And you rose against my father and have killed his seventy sons on one stone and have made Ambilek the son of his maid king over Shechem because he is your brother. If you have done truly and sincerely in making Ambilek king and have dealt well with Jerubbel and his house and have done to him what he deserved, then you rejoice with Ambilek and let him rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Ambilek and devour the men of Shechem and Milo. And let fire come out of the men of Shechem and Milo and devour Ambilek. And Jotham ran away and hid for fear of Ambilek. Ambilek ruled three years over Israel from Shechem. Here we see Ambilek and he is in Shechem. So the tabernacle is in Shiloh. And just north of that, in Manasseh, um, Ambilek is ruling from Shechem, ruling over all of Israel. And he ruled for three years over Israel from Shechem until God sent an evil spirit between Ambilek and the men of Shechem to bring the blood of Ambilek's 70 brothers upon his head because he killed them and upon the men of Shechem for helping him kill his brothers. The men of Shechem set robbers in the mountain roads to try to assassinate Ambilek because they had a spirit of evil between them now. So they were, there was some bad blood. It doesn't give the reasons. It was the spirit that started all this. And they robbed anyone who went through that way. And it was told to Ambilek. And there was a man named Gale, which means loathing, he was the son of Ebed. He came with his brothers to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And after the men of Shechem harvested the grapes and had a festival in the house of their gods, and they ate and drank and cursed Ambilek, Gael said, Who is Ambilek, and who is Shechem that we should serve him? 
Is he not the son of Zerubbabel, and Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, if you remember, who is Hamel, the father of Shechem? Well, I spoke earlier about the rape of Dinah, um, Jacob's daughter, and how they slaughtered all the men of Shechem because she was raped by the king's son. That was the king, Hamor. He was the father of Shechem. So he said, serve the men of Hamor, the Canaanites. If I were leader, I would remove Ambalek. Then he called out Ambalek, gather your army and come out. Zebul heard of it and sent a message to Ambalek, gather your fighting men tonight and wait in the field till morning. And when they come out at sunrise against you, you can ambush them. Ambilek gathered four companies of fighters, and they waited in the fields that night. In the morning, Gael and Zebul were at the gate of the city, and Ambilek's men rose up and started storming towards the city. Gael said to Zebul, That looks like men coming down from the mountains. But Zebul answered, That's the shadow of the mountain. It just looks like men. Gael said again, Look, they are in the middle of the land now. It can't be a shadow. Zebul answered, Where is your mouth now that you said who is Ambalek, and, what, and, and that we should serve him? Go fight with them. Ambalek slew many of them all the way up to the gate of the city, but they shut themselves within the city of Shechem. Ambalek made camp at a nearby city called Aruma. Zebul then expelled Gael and his brothers from Shechem. Zebul was like the mayor of the city. Ambilek waited in the field for them and began another great slaughter as they came out of the city. He entered the city fighting all day and killed all the people in it and sowed it with salt. But the people of the tower of baal Bareth entered into the tower, a stronghold in Shechem, about a thousand men and women. Ambilek brought his people to Mount, Sal- Mount Zalman, which means shady. And each one gathered a branch of a tree, and they carried it down to the tower, and they burned the tower at Shechem, with the thousand people inside. Ambilek then moved on a city named Thebes to the north. And all the people went into the tower of the city, and Ambilek went to the door of the tower to start a fire, and a woman dropped a millstone on his head. So this is the fire coming out of uh, the bramble, out of the people of Shechem against Ambilek, Ambilek against them, and they both got destroyed. By a millstone fell on his head, but he wasn't dead. He told his armor bearer, Quick, slay me with your sword. Before men say of me, a woman slew him. But he's still legendary in the Bible. A woman threw a millstone on his head. (laughs) Okay. So, after Amalek died, the people dispersed through Israel without a leader. God brought the curse of Jotham upon these people, and a fire came out from the bramble and devoured the cedars of Lebanon. Now, the cedars of Lebanon, at that time... We spoke about it in earlier um, episodes when we were talking about the Akkadian kingdom. Uh, The cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon is a mountain range that uh, stretches from, you see, uh, about where Tyre is there, just above Asher and Naphtali. It stretches from that area northward all through what, today would be called Lebanon. And it was a great forest, a a cedar forest. And those cedars were were being uh, removed industrially by by the Mesopotamians, and they were being floated down the Euphrates River into uh, Sumer. And they were also being taken by Egypt. The, The people of Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians, were harvesting the cedar and selling it to Egypt. Because it's so easy, they just make rafts out of it and float it down there and up into the Nile River. So Egypt and 
Sumer were both industrializing the cedar and uh, today there are only a few parks left in Lebanon and, and a few examples of the original cedars that used to be there. So the cedars of Lebanon becomes a prophetic term. The evil spirit that God sent upon be, between Shechem and Embilek. What it's interesting to look at the um, tactic that this evil spirit used. I, it stepped beyond um, what God sent this evil spirit to carry out the parable about the bramble and the fire. But the evil spirit uh, stepped beyond that and used it to try to erase Jacob as and the Israelites as the people of Shechem and bring it back to uh, Hamor, the king or the father of Shechem, the one who founded Shechem, the Canaanite. So that's an interesting thing to see is how the evil spirit did that and tried to erase Jacob's claim over the land. This is a terrestrial spirit, as we learned in episode two, the spirit of a Nephilim. This was about Manasseh and Gideon and the legacy of his ephod um, that this, uh, they were not godly people that were left when Gideon was gone. And this was also the beginning and the end of the cult of Baal Barith. Uh, you might hear about the cult of Baal Barith that the Israelites had. It was during the time of Gideon, and it was Gideon's ephod. <laughs> Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.